blockers. I want to know what barriers in the U.S. today as a woman. Please, give well, me one. Well, as a woman or as a woman of color? Oh, jeez. <laughs> All right, guys. Today we're going to be watching a bunch of women argue about feminism. Let's get into it. Yeah, the problem with the So Vice put out a video, anti and pro-feminist debate abortion, of course trans rights, because what are women talking about if they're not talking about men? And hashtag me too in their Vice debate series. I know a couple of people on this panel already, Sydney Watson and Pearl from Just Pearly Things, fans of both of them. So I am very interested to see how this pans out. But I'm going to go ahead and guess it's going to be a bunch of nonsense. Feminism is a big big term that encompasses so many different things that you could talk about. And I have a feeling we are not going to be able to see our lights and see our path through this conversation. But I hope that I'm wrong. Let's watch. I'm Liz Landers. I'm Vice News' chief political correspondent. And we are here today to talk about some of the biggest issues dividing women across the country. In other words, we're here to talk about feminism. First, I just want to say we know we can't represent everybody's views, but we did try our best to bring together a diverse group of women today. A diverse group of women. I have a feeling that there are going to be some biological men in this camp having this discussion about feminism, which just could not be worse when it comes to having a discussion about patriarchy and men being superior or men taking up women's spaces. To have two biological men present is what it seems like I'm seeing so far, but we'll see. In today's polarized world, is feminism dead? You I saw your hand. I think that depends on the definition of feminism. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, are we supposed to be serious? Are we, are we serious talking about this? We're talking about whether or not feminism is alive or dead or all these things, and the first person to raise their hand to discuss uh, on this topic is a biological man. I mean, uh, BFFR, be fucking for real. I strongly think that feminism is more of an action than an identity. I would say it's uplifting all women, in which case it's very alive. At the same time, um, if we do follow that definition, feminism has splintered off into so many different areas that you can look at um, people like Sheryl Sandberg who say you should just get another nanny if you feel oppressed. And if we're talking <laughs> about that kind of feminism, um, yeah, it's pretty dead. Yeah, I mean... As long as the human race exists, feminism, feminism will never be dead. There's something that we're always going to have to strive and work, work towards um, to make sure that there's equality. Hmm. I completely disagree with that. I do think that feminism is alive and well, unfortunately, and it's just taken a form that is really not helpful to women or men, but we'll get into that as the women continue to speak more. But Here's she actually points something points out something very profound that there will always be room for feminism. It's always going to be a thing that we're going to have to strive for. And these are so often the questions that we have for left leaning people. And she might not be left leaning. Uh, I don't know yet. But saying when when is this over? At what point do you achieve the goal that you've set out to achieve with this set of ideology or with this this list of asks that you have as far as your activism when it comes to being a feminist or on on racial lines or on gender lines? When are you equal and when does it stop? And as she just stated, it's an ongoing battle that is never ending, which goes to show you maybe you're dealing with ideologues rather than people who are actually trying to see change take place, uh, ways set uh, where equality is actually strived for and achieved, and then we move on. Please, let's move on. So feminism is not dead. I don't know that it can die. As long as there's power and oppression, there will be people fighting for equity. And um, until that somehow goes away, feminism is alive and well. I thought she said as long as there's power in oppression. I was like, wow. What a profound thing to say because so many people are using their oppression as power plays and as points in this sort of oppression Olympics that we're living in right now. But she said as long as there's power and oppression. I also should mention Taylor's here, by the way. Hi, Taylor. Oh, hello. Yeah, I'm just uh, 
soaking and basking in all the glory of these uh, amazing takes. But like you said, you, only mishearing right. them does it sound insightful when you actually hear what she's saying. It's just the same old, you know, Marxist oppression Olympics that we get into immediately. So great job. Exactly right. And we already have two biological men on this panel. But, you know, I figured I'd bring Taylor in as a third. <laughs> we got Cam we'll, we'll here too, so we're, 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 are, are we've we got Cam too. The women that now here talking about feminism. You honestly, you honestly might be outnumbering the women right now, but oh, uh, neither here nor there. Quick. <laughs> I think feminism um, isn't actually about equality; it's about equality when it benefits us. There's Pearl. I think feminism is really about women wanting special privileges and treatment at the expense of men, often. And I think it's Smile. alive and well, sadly. Okay. I think feminism is also alive and well. Um, there are different kinds of feminism, right? Like that is obvious. Um, and I, for me, as as a womanist, as a black feminist, right, as someone, what's a womanist? Do y'all know what a womanist is? I do no? not. I've never heard of that before. <laughs> oh my god! The There's that always a new term. Groups and ideologies and isms and ists. It just tells me we're getting further and further from reality. We're out of our skis. Gosh, womanist. One who's really thinking about human rights, dignity, right, equity, right. Oh, as equity. long as no, no word. That's not that need isn't met. We're still gonna keep fighting. I'd say it's alive and well. I'd say that it's also very nuanced, and I think what it looks like Dude. is. You sitting on this panel means that, I mean, patriarchy is certainly alive and well. It's going to differ depending on where you are in the world. For me, I just see it as a lens, which isn't necessarily antagonistic or uh, protagonistic. It's just a useful tool. Similar to what Pearl just said, I find that a lot of feminist ideology and thought today feels more of like a supremacist movement rather than something that is supposed to be advancing the goals of equality. I don't think that we can really term what's going on as feminism because it looks so different to, I think, the earlier feminist movements. So in that way, I would say it's taken its last breaths of life. It's dying. Yeah, I don't... She's right. I mean, we struggle to identify ourselves as feminists even though if we're going off of the old-fashioned meaning of the word feminist meaning that you know men and women are, are separate but should be treated equal and should have equal opportunity in the world that we live in by all means yeah i'm i'm a feminist i was living in the middle east right now dealing with what women are dealing with in those areas and in those regions Hell yeah, I'd be a feminist because there is a lack of equal opportunity there's a lack of equal treatment when it comes to being a woman in those landscapes. But now here in the United States, we're in what? Fourth, fifth wave feminism, where now feminists are fighting for men to enter women's spaces. Feminists are fighting for sexual promiscuity, anti-beauty standards. And we've, we've lost sight of what equality looks like. We're now switching out equality for words like equity, which is wholly unachievable unless you enter into some sort of totalitarian space and relationship with not only your government, but your society as a whole. And we've just lost sight of what it means to be a woman, what a woman even is, and whether or not we've already achieved equality, which by all measures that I can think of, we have. I definitely think um, it's getting more and more radicalized, for sure. So it's, it's definitely still alive. I think I'll preface and say that I don't know so much about modern Western feminism, and there might be a lot of terms that I don't know, like political jargon and stuff. But I believe in the advancement of women, whoever considers themselves a woman. Oh, oh you hear that little slip there? I, I believe in the advancement of women, whoever considers themselves to be a woman. So men. <laughs> so we're back to patriarchy. And she says she's not... She's not so much concerned or or educated on Western feminism. Then I'm sorry. Why are you sitting around at this panel right now? Because that's what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about Western feminism, which I have a feeling is going to fall off the rails multiple times during this conversation. In the, in the short clips that I've seen of this discussion, it seems like nobody can even pinpoint what they mean when they say they're talking about feminism or or how to keep that conversation contained in a conversation about man and woman. <laughs> they always venture out into different, well, I'm a black woman or I'm a trans woman. And we get lost in the sauce. Uh, so 
yeah, we're here to talk about Western feminism. So if you don't know about that, then what are you doing here? I don't know. Uh, I think there's a deficiency in society. So it's deeply rooted that um, feminism has always existed. I think America's a little obsessed with themselves and it's like always feminism is rooted in America <laughs> and like, oh, white women started it. And it's kind of offensive because for thousands of years, women have been dying for their rights. I think as a black woman specifically, uh, when you talk about feminism, yeah, the mainstream first thing you think about is a certain type of feminism that tends to exclude still, even today, even with intersectional fem feminism, exclude um, African-American women. And it's always kind of done that. And also like, upper middle class white women has predominantly been the face of what we quote unquote consider feminism. I would love if she elaborated on that. How are you excluded from the feminist movement by virtue of being a black woman? Who's excluding you? And in what spaces, in what ways? Please elaborate, because that, that's the issue here. All these baseless claims are thrown out, and very strong claims about exclusion and discrimination and oppression, and then you go, where? Can you give me an example of that? It's hush. Hush tones. I think feminism is attempting to say, okay, the first thing we agree on is that there are barriers and friction to what I need and what I want based on the fact that I'm a woman. What it ignores is that, and what privilege is, is that you may not have to think that being a woman and being a black woman and being a black woman who has a disability, for example, impacts you further. You have more barriers, you have more friction, you are less able to get what you want. You're undervalued in a way that's like, Okay, well, you know, Where? that's life. That's what I mean by equity and that we're able to, without friction, all get the same needs met. Yeah. I just feel like this is some utopic view of life, that you're supposed to glide through life without any friction whatsoever, without any barriers, without any uh, shortcomings. And that's just not life. It's just not how it works. So then when we talk about equity in creating what is a quality of outcome, Meaning no matter the circumstances, no matter what you go through, no matter what part of life you're in, you are going to have the same outcome as white heterosexual male over here or black woman over there or black trans disabled woman over here. That's nearly impossible. And it's not natural. And we're going to find, hopefully in this conversation, that we'll talk about what's natural, get into discussions about the wage gap. And people are going to complain that there's this massive wage gap between men and women and completely disregard the choices that women make that are often natural to their character, innate traits that we have. And that just goes out the window because disparity equals discrimination. If there's any difference between men and women, it's because of oppression. It's because of patriarchy. Instead of evaluating why those differences might naturally exist. Life is not meant to be frictionless. And I don't know where anybody got the idea that it is supposed to be, but it is not meant to be. But let's keep listening. Um, yep. Yeah, see, I disagree with that. I think life is easier if you're a girl, um, actually. Yeah, I, think, I think, I think there's, there's a lot advantage. of benefits um, <laughs> that men don't have. I'm, I'm not going to speak anything to race. I'm just talking about gender specifically it's usually like an excuse like honestly i think as a girl you have equal opportunity in the world i think there's benefits like for example we yeah. have quotas for women in specific jobs that are given to us that aren't given to men so yeah i would i would say it's easier being a girl That's just from a uh, viewpoint over here though uh, it seems there's a lot of privilege pretty privilege in what you're saying and mm -hmm. that you're white and you present do you think i'm pretty thank you i think <laughs> that you present in a way that beauty standards have accepted okay. and so they call me ugly on the internet all the time they, they be roasting me daily i swear to god i don't mean to say i think you're gorge i just mean that there's a certain value that we give to certain bodies I mean, let's that. also dig into why these quotas do? exist and why these, um, what you're calling because privileges Because we want exist. special treatment. Um, no, but it's because there have historically and presently in most jobs been fewer women. Why? Why are there fewer female garbage men? Why are there fewer female bricklayers and construction workers? Why are there fewer female CEOs? Can anybody answer that? And when you look at nations that are promoting gender equality and saying, yes, women, go into STEM, go into these fields. We want you there. In fact, we'll incentivize you being there. We'll pay you more. We'll give you the scholarships. We'll help you get to school. Women go, that's cool. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm going to go into nursing. I'm going to go into teaching. And you'll, you'll see that even though women have 
an abundance of opportunity. They are pushed. They are incentivized to move into these specific jobs and these specific fields. They go, no, uh, thank you for that, but I'm not going to do that. And it's something that is innate in women. And that's not to say that there are women who can't be CEOs, who can't be bricklayers, who can't be construction workers. By all means, more power to you. Go out and do those things. But most women do not want to do those things. Women are more people oriented, as somebody like Jordan Peterson would say. Men like numbers. They like analytics. They like systems. And this has all been studied and proven in the way that men and women communicate, in the things that they value in life. And and how they view their career, sometimes as an extension of themselves, other times as something wholly separate that they just give into because they need money and they need to, uh, to navigate a career in order to have the life that they want to live. There are differences in the way that men and women view these things. We should be able to be honest about that and then move on from there. That's not to say that women shouldn't have opportunities and that we shouldn't say, hey, yeah, if you want to be a woman in STEM, be a woman in STEM. Cool. But just know that most women are not going to choose that route. Exactly. And if we can acknowledge that just basic reality that sex-based differences are real, that women prefer certain things and men prefer certain things on average, then feminism's not just dead. It's dead on arrival because they're based, they're, they're starting from a place that is out of joint with reality. And how are you supposed to advocate on behalf of an entire sex or gender, whichever one you're picking today, uh, if right. you can't even start, uh, define reality or say it in basic terms? We, they don't even know what a woman is anymore. And yet somehow we're supposed to be this, have this massive coherent movement that is uh, advocating on behalf of women. So is feminism dead? I think so. Right. And the answer is not to go and then discriminate against men, which is what a lot of these fields are doing. They go, if we get an applicant and it's a man and a woman and they have the same credentials and the same background, we're going to take the woman over the man. And there's no reason to do those things. You can admit that the playing field has not been equal. Yeah, I can totally admit that. Women were oppressed for, for quite some time in this nation based on how you define oppression. But and and now we need an equal playing field. That doesn't mean that women need to be elevated above men. It doesn't mean that they need to be get preferential treatment, which is what a lot of these institutions are engaging in. Just make it an even playing field. And because of sexism. How is it sexism when we have no barriers today? So we can, we can pick who we no want to pick. Who doesn't have barriers? Women doesn't, don't have no, barriers? No, they don't. Women, yeah. What, what's we stopping have no you? Barriers. You can do whatever you want. None. Uh, what's stopping I can you? or you can? What's stopping you? As a woman, as a woman. As a, She's like, oh. I mean, as a woman, because I know you're in a wheelchair, but also that has nothing to do with the conversation that we're having right now. And I have a feeling it's going to get used as a victim card to to shut people up. So because what are you going to say to somebody who has a disability? Well, I would say, yeah, you have a disability. I bet that's really tough. It has nothing to do with the topic that we are talking about right now, because we are talking about feminism and particularly feminism in the West. Woman. As a woman, See, as a woman. That ignores a lot that I'm a woman with a disability. So Boom. there's a lot stopping me that you there don't have to think about. Well, as I said before, I'm about. speaking about women. I'm not, you're speaking I'm not, as, oh, you're speaking for yourself. You're speaking as, a, as an able-bodied, able-bodied like woman. woman. I, I, and you see this? So they, none of the feminists could answer the question, what barriers are set in front of you because you are a woman? So they moved over to the, I guess, the weakest link in the crowd, And she goes, well, I have a disability. So I'm a woman with a disability. And you see how on the periphery, all the women latch themselves onto that argument. You're able-bodied. You're able-bodied. Shut up. You're able-bodied. Even though it has nothing to do with the argument. Because they can all feel the weakness in what they're trying to say. They feel the defensiveness of not being able to defend the very point that they are sitting in these chairs to talk about. And they latch themselves onto an argument that is meant to just shut somebody up. Because what are you supposed to say to somebody who's disabled i have something to say guess what if a disabled man came into this room i'm pretty sure your barriers would be the same if not very similar so what are you talking about has nothing to do with the feminist argument because if your disability oppression points are shared with the male sex and with the male counterpart then guess what it's not an argument in this space because you would both be going through the same thing let's get down to the heart of what we were talking about and that is man versus woman what are the barriers that you have set in place? And this is where and the, is it, are you ideologically possessed um, 
alarm bells start going off even louder mm -hmm. because it, in a reasonable conversation, you should be looking for the truth. You should be looking for supporting your position with logic and evidence and saying that, hey, I believe that if we structure society this way, according to my ideas, uh, that my ideas can support a successful society. But instead, uh, as soon as they're challenged, you immediately default to these ideas of intersectionalism. And I'm, I'm right because of my oppressed category. I'm right because your argument is wrong because you are from a higher, uh, more privileged category. And I'm correct because I'm from a lower one. And that's just how the world works. And if you're going to yep. defy my narrative, you're just a part of trying to impose that oppression on me. And you see how it just stops you in your tracks from thinking logically, from truth seeking, all the things that should characterize a healthy discussion, but th but this panel's going off the rails already because that that's not the goal. There's people yep. aren't all interested in the truth that are sitting around here. It's they're so you know, and I I'm not I don't even saying this like oh I hate them or anything. It's more like I almost feel bad for these women because you just see how clouded they are by this intersectional sort of uh, thinking. Yeah, and you can feel it. Like Sydney and Pearl are clearly there. Like. Okay, I'm trying to remain calm. I'm trying to let you know just what my thoughts are on this matter so far. And here's where we stand. And so far, we have the woman in the wheelchair, the woman with the metal all over her shirt, and then the trans woman in the back, super attacky, attacky, defensive, defensive. They're not there to actually have a conversation. They're not there to actually learn about what experiences shape the way that they think they're there to just push through punch through call you an ableist racist pretty privileged individual and then move on with whatever their worldview is I that understand. is why presents course, why of course of course there's going to be other barriers if you're disabled i'm sure right well, like I'm, uh, I'm not i'm not i'm not i'm talking about as a woman so you're just going to ignore white the women have it gap. easier yes I would agree. What? You're, you're just going to ignore the pay gap, um, regulation over bodies. The pay gap has been well, proven and, the pay and gap, debunked the pay gap doesn't endlessly, exist. my friend. It doesn't, yeah, it's, so the, it's the industries that women pick. Uh, it's so funny hearing from a man who chooses to transition to be a woman and then comes to a feminist panel to complain about being a woman, complain about the wage gap, and complain about the, the patriarchal oppression that they have to deal with. Like, how much of a clown world are we really in? And it's interesting, because if you break down Eli, who I guess that's the name of the trans person there, he transitioned to be a woman. And his idea of being a woman is a very butch, short, haired very strong assertive professionally dressed woman so if that's your picture of woman that you got painted for you that you are now embodying where are we really at with feminism because that's what you think a woman is you think a woman is this strong outspoken stand up for herself fight the patriarchy person okay then i guess we've made ground because you're all here talking, you're all living in a free world, you all get to choose what you want to do with your life every single day when you wake up, and nobody is there to stop you. You can earn as much as you want, you can work as much as you want, you can have a family if you want, you can do whatever you want to do. So back to Pearl's question, name a barrier. I, and I'm not hearing any. I haven't heard one. And the, and the wage gap is easily debunked. The regulation of our bodies... Well, what are you going to talk about? Roe versus Wade, a, a subject matter that women all across the board, many of whom identify as feminists, disagree on. So, no, these are two arguments that are not working right now. Name another barrier. Industries that women pick. Uh, let's talk about it. There's a pay gap, but it's because women don't want to do the hardest industries. So. I don't think it's that simple. I think, like, I think that's just an oversimplification. I think the fact of the matter is that women structure their lives differently to men. Men don't give birth. Men don't have have to carry pregnancies men don't have to be the primary caregiver most of the time women also don't hold jobs for as long as men do they often will stop and start they'll go back into work they'll take time off they'll take part-time jobs the way that men work and women work are astronomically different and Absolutely to try to right. say that they're comparable is is where this issue comes from they're not comparable two things first of all um let's dig into why they think that um they should take these jobs which is society societal sexism and then oh. also um actually all i mean Department of Labor, all statistics, at least speaking in the U.S., um, have found that when compared for the same jobs, there still is a pay gap, particularly when it pertains to race. Because 60% of women have never asked for a raise. So how can you complain about your pay if why, you don't why ask? Are they, because, why are they not asking? Wait, what happens because, when women because, ask for a raise? So, Sorry, I just, sure, I've been yes. <laughs> This is hilarious, guys. This is hilarious. It's just like they overlook 
all the different points that were just made. Okay, and even even Eli tries to say, okay, well, even when looked at for the the same job, men and women are are paid differently according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. You guys can go and look this up. The actual wage gap that you always hear, seventy nine cents, which is so funny because over the past I don't know however many years we've been talking about the wage gap, that seventy nine cents has never changed. That number has never changed. It's always the number that you hear. How has that not changed over the years and years that activism has been being done uh, across the board on this issue? It's looking at full-time workers, all U.S. women working full-time versus all men working full-time. What's the wage difference there? It, It does not account for overtime. It does not account for education. It does not account for the types of careers chosen. It does not account for when women choose to have kids. It does not account for negotiations. It does not account for base pay. So many things that when you actually put those into account for the number, guess what the wage gap does? (gasps) It shrinks. And even if you're talking about men and women who are working the exact same job, you have to think about what? What education does that woman have versus the man? What did she go into negotiations saying and advocating for herself for? What did she say to them? Because I'll tell you right now, men and women will walk into a room, walk into negotiate, and men will say, absolutely not. I know I'm worth this. I've consulted 10 other companies. Here's what I'm worth. This is the money that I want. And women will go in and go, oh, you want to give me this? Oh, yeah, I'll take that. And I know that I've been in that position myself. This is is statistically proven as well in in surveys that they've done versus men versus women as far as what they negotiate. So you have a lot of different things that can change on any given day to create what you get paid for the position that you're in. And then you want to blame it all on patriarchy. It's ridiculous. You can't look at disparities and just go, it's patriarchy. It's racism. It's sexism, whatever. You have to account for other things that might be at play. And there's many things that might be at play. Right. And this is what happens again when you're when you have narrative based thinking, then you don't need to divide that pie chart of blame of why all the possible reasons that can explain something or explain a disparity that you observe. You don't need the actual answers. You have the answers from the get go. The fact that the disparity exists is just proof of the narrative that you already are predisposed to believe. So you don't need your thinking turns off after that. Whereas if you're actually interested in truth, if you're actually interested in facts and having a worldview that is staked in reality, then you're going to investigate the the claims and investigate the merits of the claims that are undergirding your entire worldview. And it, you know, and this is this I'm you know, you're hearing from someone in Amala who's been through that whole process of like, hey, my whole worldview was built on that house of cards and then it came eventually crashing down. Um yeah. and now that's why she's so skeptical and, and very evidence based and logical because yeah. once you realize that you wake up from the matrix, so to speak, uh, I don't know if that's a Tate Tate speech uh, <laughs> reference, <laughs> but, but then you become, you know, the, you realize how much va- more valuable facts are to formulating your perspectives and formulating your worldview and you want to be logical. And hopefully you have some compassion yeah. for people who have been on the other side. I do. And then you just meet them and they have the same arguments over and over. It's like very similar to what I talk about when I go to college campuses to speak about racism. It's like the students come and they're like, what about red line? What about slavery? What about Jim Crow? What about black maternal death rates? What about police violence? And it's like the same list of arguments all the time. And they want it to be true so bad. It's no, it's no longer about actually trying to get to the truth of why something is happening or why we're seeing a disparity. It's all about, well, my worldview says this. So this is what I have attached, as you said before, Taylor. They have no interest in, in feeling better about it. Wouldn't it feel better to go, actually, it's not due to sexism. Women make choices (laughs) and they're proud of those choices and they go on to build their own lives. Isn't that so cool that there's just these natural differences that we observe and that's why women do what they do. It's all born out of natural choice. That should feel great, but they don't want to feel great. They want to feel oppressed. They want to feel like the system is against them. So much so that a biological man will transition to be a woman and then complain about the harm that it's done to them. I've been wanting to say something, but I want to be respectful. Of, I don't know. I don't want to interrupt Do people, it. and I want to let them finish their just thoughts. Jump in, just but you know, it's just, uh, it is a very privileged label, right, to be able to say that you're feminist, right? right? And I say that because I come from a working class background of Dominican immigrant parents. My mother would not necessarily identify as a feminist. I look to my mother, and I do think of her as a feminist. A lot of my ideas and my 
empowerment comes from seeing her like survive and put food on the table. When I'm thinking about feminism, I'm always thinking about who's not part of the conversation. What are the barriers? How do we think about equity? How do we think about self-empowerment and agency and having a voice, right? And having choice. It's interesting that she says what qualifies her mother uh, being a feminist in her eyes that she provided and she put food on the table. It's what, it's what your mom should do for you. It doesn't make you a feminist. It just makes you a mom. And thinking about our basic human rights, education, access to health, uh, homes, like having bread, having food, and those things are very important, right? And they're at the crux, right, about of what a lot of us here know that we need. It's like there are the barriers, right, that we constantly ignore that are very much systemic and microaggressive, right? We see them and experience them every like day. Like what? She just said a whole lot of nothing. She just said a whole lot of nothing. She said people deserve food, water, shelter, uh, health care, and these are the crux of the conversation, and it's systemic and microaggressive. Yeah, and then the, we need to what? include the voices that always get excluded, uh, which you would think she's probably referring to, like, Black, Hispanic, disabled people, while she sits on a panel with those people that's yep. being blasted all over the internet. Right, with two biological mm. people. <laughs> In the U.S., so, like what? What would you like to know an example of? Some I, I know you said, you said that there's, like, barriers. I want to know what barriers in the U.S. today as a woman. Many unbearable hours later. Please, give well, me one. as a woman or as a woman of color? Oh, jeez. <laughs> I think, I think oh I'm not going to survive this. Uh, and you know what? I started this video being like, I'm, I'm only going to stay calm because you would remain calm if you were on this panel. You're going to stay calm because that's how you would talk to these ladies. But it is just incessant i cannot believe it name a barrier that you face as a woman in america the question could not be more specific uh well i think you have pretty privilege and i'm disabled okay i get that you're disabled barriers that come with that what about the woman part um um you're ableist and you're you're you've got pretty privilege okay can you name a barrier as a woman or as a woman of color <sighs> let's be specific as a woman I and uh the fact that they went right back to like <clears throat> the intersectionalism again mm -hmm. for the, the argument just is like, I mean, we called it the first time and then, it's yep. like, oh, when, whenever they're challenged, they default back to this. And what happens as soon as he's challenged again, Pearlie's just asking simple questions of, hey, can you give I an know. example of the oppression that you are facing, of the barriers that you keep bringing up? And the, it, they just default right back into intersectionalism. It is crazy. Yeah, wow. They really need to do better. They really do. That's wild. To have a belief that you hold so strongly, yet you are wholly incapable of defending, which I've been there. I've done that. It's just wild. We as don't. A woman. Well, no, I can't answer as a woman. I just, just feel like your woman, question is right? kind of hostile when you're feminism. like, I don't, I, there are they no don't barriers to today. what I. Dude, if I was like a Meninist watching this right now, this would be all the proof that I would need to think that men are superior. And it's because they picked women who cannot defend their beliefs. And I will say this now, obviously I'm not a Meninist and I think men and women should be treated equally. But wow, could you could have picked better leftists to defend these things. Wow. I want congratulations that means you have a privilege where you're not facing any friction and that's mean, showing and i feel like it's i think like as an american i think as an american you're very privileged oh, like i mean i'm right. not ignoring that yeah, right. we're at like a so. basic level of what i mean the feminist movement is when it comes to just being born a woman right physically pound for pound we are born as women and we have less lean muscle mass than men so there are issues of violence and assault and stuff like that and so therefore there are policies there are things to help women physically like for example i believe being able to carry a firearm and being able to use that safely to defend yourself against men who are born naturally with more muscle mass than a woman i'm still i i heard her okay she said some valid things men and women have different strength profiles men are wholly stronger than women so therefore, we have equalizing laws as far as women experiencing violence. Okay, but where's the barrier? Because that's not an answer to the barrier question. Because women are protected under the law, especially when it comes to violence perpetrated uh, against them. Uh, so 
where's the barrier? Like, what are we working towards? What, what's, where are we going from here? From equity, what would in a world that, that has equity look like? Like, would it be, would it be 50% of everyone in the same jobs? Would it be like prison, 50%? That's equality. 50%. Yes. So, so, so what is No, that's equity. <laughs> they don't even know what their own terms mean. Equality is being treated equal. It is equal opportunity, meaning you have the opportunity to get this. Both men and women have it. I don't know who's going to get it. Equity is 50% women here, 50% men here. In in CEOs, we're going to look for women to even out the scales. We want equality of outcome, meaning I could split it through the center with a knife and it would be equal. So she doesn't even know what she's talking about equity look like? So equity is generally described as a state of fairness no, because historically a lot of people have been arguing for equality, but mm. what does that give us? Um, like uh, like 0.5 of the 1% being woman, this doesn't really do anything for mm. us. Mm -hmm. um, and so people have talked about us I just equity can't. instead, which is um, instead of sameness, it's fairness. Mm -hmm. And this would mean that we remove systemic barriers mm -hmm. to um, to engage in society, what barriers? not just for women, but also for so, everyone. So which barriers? <gasps> Thank you for okay, those barriers so, that you don't believe in. Uh, <laughs> those barriers that you don't believe in, that I have not been able to state, that I have not been able to point to, lay out, describe, define whatsoever, barriers you don't believe in. You see how they just shut down conversations because they are incapable of answering for themselves. Incapable. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't. Do for you to have a bunch of ramps in your life. It doesn't do shit. I need those ramps, right? Can we stick to male versus female? That's, that's my question. So I, I'm thinking male versus female. But my so feminism my, so, includes so, ability. So, it so, includes but my race. my question is you guys can, can talk. Women can talk. versus men. Like, what, what barriers do we need removed? <laughs> that, that's my statement. I'm not, I'm not stating anything else. I'm stating women versus men. It's very silly. Like, so it's so what barriers? Like, it's not silly. You guys are silly because I'm not hearing a damn thing. And what is so crazy to me, this video is 43 minutes and 40 seconds. Sydney said this was a four to five hour long debate session. Can you imagine sitting through this for four to five hours of women just bouncing around, refusing to answer a question, but crying about their own oppression? I, oh, Lord. The it's question a, it's is a fair silly. question. So, yes. yeah, I, I it's not a fair question. It's how is it not a fair question? Kind of proving the point of why what people, especially black women, other people who are anybody who's not white, why we hear feminism and we don't want that label because it means, I'm just going to say, it means that. Like, it means that you're, you've already gone to a pinnacle of whatever you think your happiness needs or whatever your survivalist needs are when there are people on lower end who are trying to survive, who are trying to get to a point of what should be normal um, based on what other people have. It sort of sounds like you're saying what? feminism is not always inclusive then. Right. It's most of the time it's not inclusive. It, it, it's, it more times than not, it's, it's not. Awesome. So, and within the just... Feminism space, again, they're obviously the very basic is male versus female versus, you know, but unfortunately, we've only had one subset of women be the face and voice and the academics and research and everything to be able to say, well, that's the standard we need to be in when there are other people who are still trying to get to some type of normalcy and just living. What is the biggest <laughs> issue then nothing. that feminism faces? I think it's the mindset women taking like the agency, women taking initiative. I think it's mindset holding them back a lot because if you want to be in a competitive world and compete, you have to have the right mindset. And I think a lot of people blame their lack of confidence or what society tells them um, for the reason that they're not achieving what they need to achieve when that's not the case. You have to have the mindset of it's achieving because the men who built the world had the mindset of building it. So the women who want to engage and build that further, they need to have that same mindset. Based. Yeah. Like it's for in order for your ideology to be true or like come to fruition and all the things that you're describing and, and, and saying are, are going to happen, you have to fail. These women have to fail in order for what they're saying to be true. Uh, and it's just going to be 
just a self-fulfilling prophecy because you're saying I'm oppressed, I'm oppressed and all this horrible stuff is happening to me and I have all these barriers and that's why I didn't get the job. That's why I don't make as much as the man does. That's why I wasn't able to build this. And it's all your mind self, your mindset feeding into yourself because the barriers are not there. We are, we were 13 minutes into this video and they've not been able to state a single one. So it must be your mindset. It must be the way that you're viewing the world. And that's why you're not achieving and you're going to continue to not achieve because that's how you view yourself and your position on this earth. I don't think we do. I don't, I think it's like assuming that we all want to be capitalist babies. Right. I think that men are not well adjusted in the society <laughs> and women are not trying to re-embody what they have built for us. Mm. I think that like what we're forgetting is a very important detail, which is just like human respect and dignity yeah, that's and true. not asking people to prove buzzwords, what buzzwords, their experience buzzwords. is and to prove to you. Like it is like such conservative thinking to say like, I don't understand, explain it to me versus just saying, I don't understand and let me respect what you are. Absolutely not. She's saying I, you, you should not be asking people to explain the claims that they're making. You should just say, I don't understand that, but I respect your experience. Absolutely not. When have we ever lived in a day and age where you don't have to substantiate the claims that you are making? If I raise my hand right now and say, Cam just punched me in the face and I'm in pain because Cam just punched me. He's rude. He's a white supremacist right. and, yeah, and he hates women. Guess what? I'm going to have to substantiate that. I'm going to have to have some proof. And it's going to go beyond me just saying that that is my experience. It's the same with these women. You don't get to just hop up on your soapbox and say, I'm oppressed and there's so many barriers, and then not give an example when people ask you for it. That has never been the way the world works. It will continue to be uh, not the way that the world works. And just, no, I'm yeah. expecting right. one. Mm -hmm. that real quick. Uh, what she's saying there is an example of what they call standpoint epistemology, which is when you say, you know, you can epistemology is how you have knowledge. You have knowledge based on where you're standing from. And so your knowledge is valid just because you're the one who has the knowledge, basically. And so the in, in postmodernist thinking, which is the other side of this, we talked about Marxism earlier, and I'm sorry to go nerdy on you, but I just can't help but see <laughs> the roots of where a lot of this thinking is coming from. But in postmodernism, it's all about subjective truth and uh, that, yep. that there is no no objective reality. And so, like you know, Amal is saying, in a logical world, in reality, you make a claim and then you have to demonstrate the veracity of that claim with evidence. But in this new utopian world that works in our fictional a construct of our minds uh you don't have to do that whatever you say is valid i mean you can just you know paint this very broad confusing picture that sounds very nice of saying well we're not giving enough voice to these ideas and that's their experience and this and that and by by the time they're done talking you've gotten so far away from the original question which was you know what are the barriers that women are facing uh, that and and what can what what is feminism and is feminism dead we're so far away from that now because we're we're just that many layers deep into this postmodernist Marxist gobbledygook uh, that is just, but you see how it keeps them from getting to the issue at hand and also just getting yep. to basic reality. And getting to any sort of achievement. You know how much you could have done in the time that you've spent arguing over some BS that is really not effect in effect in your life? Oh my gosh, you could have gotten so much done. You could have broken so many glass ceilings, but here we are. I, I'm about to break my laptop screen listening to again? this. Gosh, again. <laughs> <laughs> again. Wherever you starting point, I'm respecting that. I'm really respecting that. I'm saying that if you don't have the mindset, you can even achieve it. You're never going to even try. So yes. it's never achieve what? Like, what are we talking achieve about? Whatever you want. Like rejected this, like, no, capitalist achieve. ideology achieve. on every woman. Achieve <laughs> whatever it is. What did she say? Any What? Did she ever mention the free market? Did she ever mention making money? Did she ever mention competitiveness or anything like that? No, she didn't. All she said is if you want to achieve, you have to have the mindset of achieving. That's whatever you want. Because guess what? We're living in a world of equality where you can go and choose whatever you want and seek that out. That's what she's talking about. Is you're looking for equality, equity. But what I'm saying is women in the feminist space and a lot of these other spaces, we don't acknowledge that we have to take the initiative. 
we have to take the action. We have to have the mindset. We have to demand those things. I don't understand how we're getting so off topic. This is about feminism, feminism today. <laughs> Whereas you, everybody Sydney. wants to make this about their individual, oh, I hear all the, the multitude of other things that factor into my person. Great. This is about feminism. It's about womanhood. I understand that all of you have your own individual experiences and, and the other things that feed into you as a person. That's perfectly fine. But this is where intersectionality falls off the planet and loses, I would argue, probably the vast majority of people, including me. I'm not even a feminist. I don't give a crap about feminists arguing amongst themselves about who's the most victimized. But this is annoying to listen to. I, I honestly just, I don't understand anything anybody's even trying to get at. Look, Good. I just want to say that, that I don't think equity and this concept of competition can't coexist with each other. Equity is building more facilities for people who need them. It is recognizing that there are holes in the market and there's opportunities for women and feminine expansive people and meeting those feminine opportunities. I, I yeah. think equity can can buoy the, the pre-existing system that we live in in a good way. And this is again a whole bunch of nothing. She just said that I don't think that equity has to be completely separate from competition. Didn't did not make a point as to how uh, those two things are literally they're wholly separate. Did not make a point as to making them converge in any single way, shape, or form. I, it's just so. But we're <sighs> gonna get to um, what I think the real feminist arguments are are based off of policy, and abortion is the biggest one. How many of you would identify as pro-choice? Let's do a show of hands for pro-choice. I feel like pro-choice is pro-life, though. But... Yeah, yeah. Okay, and folks who identify as pro-life? I feel, oh my gosh. Why do you identify as each? You've gone from legal, safe, rare to, yeah, I'm so proud. Let me beatbox in front of the Planned Parenthood. Yeah, I got murder on my mind. I, the fact that, that it's celebrated that, that murdering uh, children, especially uh, in late-term pregnancies, is celebrated that people are so proud of themselves for mutilating a fetus is just, it, it, it blows my mind. And I don't think that you need yeah. to be pro-life to even take that and, stand. And you said late-term pregnancy. Yes. A lot of abortions do not happen I made the distinction. Oh, I made no. the distinction right. specifically right. because right. lots of people still celebrate. There are people who, when the laws were passed actually here in right. New York, they, they said, yes, great, yes, I love the right, fact but that... you need to ask about what are people celebrating, right? They're celebrating access. Well, we're not well, celebrating okay. killing kids. Access to what? It's just a question. Uh, but I think as far as the people being enthusiastic and celebrating over it, I will say that I think most people, by and large, uh, regardless of what side you're on, are not happy about getting abortions or celebrating getting abortions or anything like that and i do think for the most part it is a very solemn act for all involved uh so i don't know about encouraging uh, although i have seen i have seen instances of leftist women celebrating outside the planned parenthood and cheering and you know doing that stuff as far as how that reflects on the entire group i hope not much like that's that's but not what it why, is well, well so this is right. what i'm saying so like, when, here's the thing when we're talking about access to reproductive health and to abortion rights right into being pro-choice listen that's your body you do you the child if is you not decide, your body as i go a baby it's so scary <laughs> i just can't the trans the trans woman are you uh, about this at all it's just very very interesting not that i'm saying that you shouldn't be able to have an opinion on it but it's just fascinating for me to hear people calling like guns the biggest equalizer for women but taking their choices away from them at a policy level um why is that having a gun is an equalizer it is. having rights is an equalizer yeah, having right. choice is right. an equalizer just like a gun right and in this country the birth policies control. that are pushed to continue <laughs> perpetuating patriarchy <laughs> and anti-women um, like taking the autonomy away from women, it is heartbreaking to see women pushing that propaganda. No, I, it's all brainwash. Like you, oh, it it's is, brainwash um, because you don't think, agree with no, me. No, I, because so I've been brainwashed. brainwashed. I have. See, there you go. That's an interesting question. It's brainwashed because you don't agree with me, right? I'm brainwashed because you are not on the same side that I'm on, right? Let's hear her response. Live deeply institutionalized. Damn, I, I have lived under I, Islam. Yeah, I'm not interested in any of that. Like, there's no like guilt for me. Human. No, I'm not interested in like living, thinking that like women are doing this really bad thing. Like, in it my is. religion, abortion is actually allowed. If the woman needs it, she's allowed because you know it's it's very interesting how like 
fundamental America is. Like, this fundamentalist. Is not, this is nothing to very, do very, with very, like, even deep, religion. This is very conservative basic, thinking. scientific, yeah. human right. We're also talking about mm -hmm. people not having access to abortion clinics where they're doing the things themselves and they die. No. Right? We're also talking about women in the hospital who are pregnant, Which, yeah. who have chosen to stay with their pregnancy and have issues at hospitals and hospitals that are like, oh, no, we don't do that. Listen, for whatever reason, you don't need to explain it to anybody, but a lot of times when we're talking about access to reproductive health, for me, I'm thinking about black indigenous people of color, particularly <sighs> women and girls who are working class, Always. who do not Always have even to access it. to like proper sexual education. It's the oppressive state of saying, I will force you to have a child even against your own will. Thank you, force you. Force you. It's just like how many how many abortions can you truly say are are due to force? And I'm, by force, I mean rape, incest, uh, those types of situations. A very small percentage of them. So sure, you can make those arguments and talk about how maybe these are cases that it should be allowed in, but you're not really arguing for that. You're arguing for the 63 million other abortions that are happening. And, and as far as those are concerned, force has nothing to do with it. Nobody forced you to go and engage in sexual activity. Nobody forced you. Oh, right. Especially when you're thinking about women and girls who, who would be forced to have these children who are already living in very traumatized and scare and scare situations. You want to ask about barriers? That's a barrier right there. Does trauma mean your life is not worth having? Women in poverty aren't able to access the way that rich women are. And no matter what happens, rich women are going to keep getting abortions and people in poverty are going to not. Not an and argument. the choice, opening it up, the overruling is marginally <laughs> affecting people of color, people in poverty, way more than people who are going to get access to those abortions. Actually anyway. incorrect. You're mis the misquote. There's actually more abortions for people in poverty. It's just a at a lower rate. There's actually more abortions for people in poverty just at a lower rate. So, I think she just meant to say the first part. Yeah. I think. I would imagine. Why do you think that abortion has been so tied up in this feminism conversation? It's all just social structures set up around bodies. So if not all women are able to have babies, but it's about the barriers and value that we give to these specific bodies, right? And so if abortion <laughs> happens in a woman's body, that's why this conversation is coming up. Can I ask you a question? Sure. sure. You said um, that not all women are able to have babies or, or pregnancies. Are you saying, meaning like an infertility issue? A number of reasons. Okay. There's all kinds of reasons that not all women are having babies. Pearl, I saw your hand up. Yeah. Um, I think women want to sleep around and not have any consequence for it. Hell yeah, yeah we do. Yeah! <laughs> okay, I need to break it to Eli. Um, even if you did <sighs> sleep around with a million men, you would never have the consequence of needing an abortion. Uh, but anyways, and but you heard, you heard them. Yeah, oh, hell yeah, we do. Okay, cool. So read, at least you're like, saying it. At least you're admitting it. The, the clown world we're in that these are the kinds of people even having this discussion. Uh, just It just goes to show you the state that we're in right now. And yeah, the, the, you just heard them admit it. You guys just want to sleep around and be promiscuous and not have any consequences. Hell yeah. Yeah, we do. Yeah, instead of, you know, taking person. Is the White House going to invite like a trans TikToker to weigh in on women's issues with the president? I mean, come on. What kind of world are we living in here? Yeah. When will that happen? I want to Gosh. sleep around and not have any consequence for it. Hell yeah, yeah we do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, instead of, you know, taking personal accountability and being on birth control, they just want to, like, do whatever they want. <sighs> You Whoa. say this like it's I a think bad that's thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It almost sounds like you said. <laughs> Can I also ask, do you have any care to empower women or is disempowering women part of your like steez? What do you view empowering us? Do you think it's empowering to tell women to be promiscuous and sleep around? Do you think it's empowering to tell women that they're victimized by a patriarchal society? Do you think it's empowering to tell women that they're always going to be under the thumb of a man, even though they have abundant choices in this world and they can do whatever they want with their lives? Are you empowering people? It's just so clown world that you think that that is the definition of empowering. What Pearl is doing, what Sydney 
is doing is empowering women and actually saying, hey, guys, lift the wool off of your eyes and recognize that you can do whatever you want. To see this is shame, insult, guilt, and need to be right, okay. I, why is it empowering to sleep around? No, no, why is what I'm empowering? saying is like, I feel like you, you do like take, like the way why you speak on women is very sort of like, ah, women just don't want to do this. Ah, women just don't have Sorry. this. Ah, yeah, women just wanted yeah, this. Maybe I and I wonder time. why you have so much like hatred towards I women. I don't hate women. Where does that root in? It sounds I don't hate like women. you do. I am a woman. I, am, I, I, I don't doesn't mean you don't have self-hate. I self can be black and still be internalized exactly. racism. Exactly. Like, yeah, I'm saying her. specific things that you're saying. Like, women don't want to work. Women don't want to this. Mm -hmm. Women want to sleep around. Mm -hmm. Where did you learn these uh, belief right. systems from? Because, okay, they, the question was, why, why does abortion keep getting brought up? 40% of women that have had abortions have had two or more. 40%. Good for so, them. so what does that say to me? Good they they're using it as a form of birth control. And they don't track the 60%. Mm. What kind see, of abortion? Can you let me finish? They don't track the 60% to say who in the future has abortion. So to me, it's like, why are they why are they dying so hard for abortion? They want to sleep around with no consequences, even though you have 41 forms of birth control. Who does that benefit? I don't think that benefits women. I exactly. think actually that benefits men because it means that men can have sex with you without consequence. It means that you can sleep with whoever you feel like, great, but there are consequences because women are the ones who get pregnant and carry babies and give birth. It's very these are binary these are, version of yes, sex. Yes, because, because sex is binary, but, but please. Yeah, you, a feminist is honestly probably most men's dream right now for the most part because what, what do they have to do for you? They don't have to care for you. They don't have to provide for you. They don't have to work so they have something to give you. They can have sex with you whenever they want. And if you get pregnant, they don't have to worry about a baby whatsoever. They don't have to hold a door for you. They don't have to stand on the right side of the sidewalk. They don't have to do anything for you at all. And you just give it up to them because what? That's empowering to you. It's so crazy. Like if somebody told me tomorrow that actually feminism was a trick instituted by a man who just wanted to get laid and wanted to sleep with a bunch of women so he tricked a whole generation of women into believing this and then starting only fans and sleeping with whoever they wanted to sleep with i would believe it because you are an immature man's dream right now just being promiscuous doing nothing giving yourself and your body and mind up to somebody who does not care about you and god forbid you get pregnant go get an abortion Please let me finish my point. Oh, God. <laughs> It's tricking women into thinking that aborting a pregnancy, terminating a pregnancy, is something to be celebrated. When in reality, for a lot of women, especially those who are doing it under duress, say that they've been raped, or that, you know, in in this in the small circumstances where something really traumatic has happened to them, that's a medical decision. Or or say that they're they're miscarrying and then they have to you know have a, a an assisted termination. That's a medical procedure. It's not a celebration of oh look at the. The idea, the, the sort of like moral setting of that it needs to be rare is, uh, I think the delineation between that's a medical abortion and that's like a fun abortion is really interesting because they're all medical. It's all a medical procedure. And so no matter what you're doing, going in there and getting it, like that's, it's, it's not like, oh, you're only allowed to, it's just like, you should just be able to get a medical procedure done when it's something that you need done. We should. Uh, I mean, the, the very thing that Sydney just laid out is the idea of need and is the idea of being forced, which is why she said she's sympathetic to things like rape and medical necessity and miscarriage where you go and get a DNC. These are two, these are different things when you talk about somebody who, oh, oops, I got pregnant. Let me go get an abortion. It's essentially like, uh, okay, getting cancer taken out of your body versus getting a boob job. There are things that you make the choice and seek out the medical procedure, a medical procedure that you would not need if you did not seek it out. And there is necessity, or at least enforced uh, uh, pregnancy, where you're just being placed in this position by no choice of your own. And to say that we should not delineate between the two of those is BS. And be desensitized to taking someone's life. That should never be an empowering factor for a woman. I definitely agree in that, like, there should be no absolute thing any woman should do. There should not be an absolute response to incest or rape or any of these things. Every woman should have the choice of if they want to or not want to carry that child, whether it is having fun, getting raped, incest, whatever it is. It is. I don't glorify and glamorize abortion. I think it's a very traumatic thing. I doubt that if somebody wants has to do, like, if they 
have to do it, they'll do it. I don't think that people are like, you know, I uh, you doing that. like have six, get the seventh free and having fun with it. Um, and I think that like glamorization and glorification of any side is not okay. Did the Dobbs decision make anybody here uh, sort of rethink abortion, abortion access, reproductive health care? It's anti-woman, right? It's anti, it does not center people to have that voice for themselves and their own decisions, right? It is a barrier, right? Mm. It's <laughs> giving more, it it's giving more agency disagree? to women because it's moving it back to the state level. So locally, but why would the state have locally, the, the women, to tell me what to do? Locally, it does, <laughs> she doesn't understand. <laughs> Gosh, okay. Women have that power. Areas. If you take out the, the, the viewpoint that life begins at conception, which is a, a really big defining principle for both uh, the pro-life crowd who very, very you know, vehemently believe that, and then obviously a lot of the pro-choice crowd do not believe that, taking that out of the equation, you do not have just whatever kind of autonomy you want as a person, it's regardless of male or female. You can't just have free run to do whatever the hell you want. That's not how society operates. So at, no point, at no point do I have the right to tell anyone in this room what they should or should not do with their body. But it's, not, what, but it's not yeah, about your body. body. That's, it's, that's not about, I have a question it's not, here. It's not about okay, your body. It's about the kid's body. I, I don't care what you do with it's your body. It's my body. It's, right? it's, We're it's, talking it's, about talking my about, body. Well, you're talking We're about not Jordan, I saw your hand creep up. <sighs> the Dobbs decision for me reinforced how important it is that we approach these issues from a cultural perspective because it reinforces something that I have told uh, many of my colleagues and peers in the past, which is that so long as you lack a cultural consensus, any issue any issue can become a political football that can be decided by another election cycle. And so long as there is no strong consensus, uh, I would expect this to be our reality going forward, these extremely vitriolic and aggressive conversations until there's another miraculous consensus that brought about Roe v. Wade. But what it more or less reinforced for me is that we're going to have more of these difficult conversations. I wanted to- Good, yeah, it's true. Uh, there is no consensus on this issue, not among men, not among women. So it, these are conversations we are going to continue to be having. Uh, and it really, in, in my opinion, has nothing to do with feminism. Talk about transgender issues. Should go. trans women be included in feminist conversations? How about in women's spaces? <laughs> you guys can be included in the conversation, right? Like men can have conversations about uh, feminism but you are not included in the way that you think you are. And you are certainly not affected by these, these patriarchal structures that you claim to be talking about. Now, we can get into a very nuanced conversation because it's going to affect trans people who pass as women very different than trans women who do not pass as women. And we can get into the crux of that, but I want to talk about the heart of it in that you're not biological women. So much of these conversations do not pertain to you in any way, shape, or form. Yes, they're women. What's the question? <sighs> Girl, Trans the women are women. The contrast between her answer and uh, your, what you just laid out is pretty hilarious. <laughs> yep. Yes, they're women. Um, <sighs> so I, I want to come at this from the um, position of an athlete. Oh, Jesus. Um, so, so oh, I Jesus. Place... Oh, Jesus. Why? Why are you concerned about what she's about to say? She's a woman talking about what she's gone through. Shouldn't you be cheering? Am I pro basketball, semi pro volleyball? So when it comes to like athletic spaces, I don't think that trans women should be allowed into athletic spaces because I don't think it's a not. fair. Um, I think we, as female athletes, we work so incredibly hard for the little opportunity there is in women's sports. Would this be a like, barrier? For like you this, there's no barrier. There's less opportunity in some industries. That's, that's what a them. barrier is. There's less. No, it's, it's not. not. No, no, no. It's that's based on the market. Means. Okay. Hold on. Hold on, on guys. Based, let's... Okay. So again, we work very hard for the little opportunity there is in the space because we're not as entertaining as the men. Sorry, we're just not. And so it's like, you're gonna take the little opportunity that we're given. And the problem is like, it, we can't compete. We can't. Like, I, I'm six foot. If I go up against a six foot guy and I play basketball with him, he's going to body me. And even what happens if, if I go up against you? Even, 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 body me. Yalda, even, Yalda, even, on, even if I have years more of training, and so it's like you're taking away the little opportunity that we're given and we all work so hard for, and you're just mm -hmm. giving it back to biological guys. It's like this will be the end of women's sports. Have Eli, you tried confidence? Uh, Eli, hold on. <laughs> Have you tried confidence? 
<laughs> I'm sorry, but confidence doesn't send testosterone coursing through your blood. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Have you tried confidence? Which is so funny because when the young black woman in the front said, you guys need to change your mindset and ha be more confident in your ability and go out there and ask for the things that you want. They swore up and down it wasn't about confidence. It wasn't about mindset. But when you put yourself in the unbelievable position of competing against biological grown men, then they want to turn to somebody and say, you need confidence. Oh, shoot. Mini Sorry, Eli. confidence can't make me bench what a guy benches. Exactly. I don't confidence understand can't make why me you guys are so hostile. She's sharing her and experience can't in a specific No, she's field. sharing And I'd have to go. No, she's yeah. not. She's, she's, she's a woman who's had no, an experience. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, you guys are so Pearl obsessed finish. with your own experiences right. and your own existence. And yet when a woman is sitting here telling you, I feel as though this is unfair and this is compromising and this situation is not helping women, you guys are like, meh, meh, meh. but when you're like, I'm a black person that did this 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 and this then it's valid and, and fair and viable mm -hmm. eli i want to give you the chance to respond um so this is basically a joke of a talking point everyone has biological advantages in sports how what how Ugh. tall are you um uh, five eleven and a half i'm yeah, tall i'm i'm five foot eight mm -hmm. i am a trans woman i you would crush me you would absolutely yeah. bone density me. wrist strength exactly yes. lung capacity hand and feet size the testosterone that you are utilizing on a daily basis, it is incomparable. Well, density, you can't switch those. Yeah, exactly, you would crush me. But also, Eli, no. you would never play at the level that Pearl plays because exactly. you would never get there. So exactly. let me give you a few more examples here too. So Michael Phelps produced more lactic acid in his body, which caused him to swim better than any of his competitors. This was widely celebrated and nobody contested it. So do you think we should put Michael Phelps in a female swim competition? Would you contest that? No, you wouldn't because you're ideologically driven. Michael Phelps does not compete against women. Women do not compete against men in virtually any sport unless it's something that has to do with like what? Sharpshooting, maybe, maybe archery, something like that. Women do not compete against men because women are not as strong as men. When you go on a golf course and you see that the tee for men is feet behind where the women are, do you want to know why? because men are stronger they have more force to put forth into their swing women don't have that and you can see this in virtually every single sport where it is segregated and segregated for a reason real extreme examples we can use of this is ufc fighting would you want to see a woman go in the cage with a man it has happened because we have uh, trans fighters now entering female spaces but no you wouldn't want to see that because you would be watching a woman battered and abused live on television. And we all know that to be the case. To be so delusional that you think biological men should be able to come in and crush women in their sports that they've worked so hard for, as Pearl stated, it's just insane. It's bonkers. Now, to, this is in performance enhancing hormone. So we all have different bodies. And now I'm not saying that trans women who aren't on hormones should participate, but there are, I mean, every major, major medical and every major sports organization nope. agrees that yes. trans women who have been on hormones for between one and three years, depending on the organization, have the same competitive abilities. That's that the, the study that you're referencing had like she said every major sporting organization and every major scientific entity. Is that basically what she just said or he just said? Absolutely not. Like I'm getting PTSD from COVID people. when they said all the experts agree that this is the case. Yeah, we need to literally. lock down. We need to keep you know shut down kids' schools. You need to get 20 jabs. It's experts agree, guys. We don't need to we don't need to think for ourselves or look at the evidence. Yeah. The experts say literally. So. Yeah. No. Only nine out of ten dentists approve my freaking toothpaste, and you expect me to believe that a hundred percent of your experts think that trans women should be in women's sports? Get out of here. People participated. That is misinformation, not, by the way. I'm referencing several different studies. I'm a trans woman and a researcher. Is it's getting this, personal. This I don't want it to be personal. I don't want it to be personal. Don't count because they're not the right kind of opinions, and we're constantly shouted over and talked over, regardless of what we look like, because there's one group in society that basically takes precedence and it's frustrating so yeah of course it's 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 frustrating oh, because when we try to talk about it we get shouted down, down we get so told to be quiet we, we get we get spoken down too as well so okay, there's hostility there for plenty of women let's try to make this an opportunity <laughs> to speak. You're witchy living a white woman from australia you live in a bubble and you're pissed that voices that have been silenced forever finally can be heard that's why they oh look at how angry she is it's so funny. If you listen to what Sydney just said, 
She said, you are literally discounting the experiences of women because you look at them and make a judgment on the way that they look and say that their opinion is not valuable anymore and it's not worth it. This woman gives off a little witch cackle and she goes, you're literally a white woman from Australia and you're upset that voices that have not been heard are now being heard. She did exactly what Sydney just brilliantly laid out for everybody listening. She did it not not only two seconds later. Wow. They have the voice because they speak up. Okay, we're having a conversation about transgender women participating in sports, and I wanted to allow more people to participate. Jordan, I wanted to hear from you. So I am not a professional athlete. It, the closest thing I have ever done to anything athletic was I used to do competitive show choir when I was younger. And... Um, I don't feel really qualified to make carte blanche statements about whether or not trans women should compete in every kind of sport. And I understand that that is kind of, that's a hard pill to swallow. And for me, my first inclination is to approach everything through a lens of inclusivity. But at the same time, I also can't speak accurately to every kind of sport and the different things that go into it. So I really think in these instances, the decisions are best left up to it's the professional governing bodies that dictate these particular sports. I just feel like in places, as an ally, in places where there's no understanding, we can just respect and not really, like our opinions don't fucking matter. Eli, I saw you what? nodding your head over there. Several times. You say as you're on Vice, widely accredited, outlet um <laughs> so um th this is more than about sports this is about um free free and equal participation for transgender people in social life and the right sees this as a socially acceptable way to begin to remove trans people from different engagements in our society so it does just start with sports or bathrooms or locker rooms something that they find is more acceptable and then at this point they started to move into education getting trans teachers fired banning trans books this is a route that um, is very effective because it's seen as more acceptable um, but it's also overlooking a lot of major details. Like, I mean, do y'all know how many um, trans women have won national titles? One too many. One. one it's, too it's many. Leah Thomas is the only one. one. What is that? You can't just throw out, oh, well, they haven't won. Only one person has won national titles. That doesn't matter. There's plenty of women who aren't competing for national titles who are in high school. They're in college. Uh, they are working on uh, professional leagues and trans people are coming in and taking their awards and taking their places in their spots within teams so it doesn't matter how many national titles have been won we can point to athletes everywhere that are, are dealing with this we had taylor silverman on the show a professional skateboarder who dealt with a biological man coming in and, and winning uh, a red bull competition that pays you money so you're talking about actual damages financial damages when it comes to uh trans women entering these spaces let alone the, you know, the physical damages that a lot of women are going, uh, are, are experiencing in this uh, fighting, like, as I said before, where you have women fighting biological men. It's just unbelievable. We're seeing it in weightlifting, surfing, skating, fighting, basketball, swimming, you name it, it's happening. I mean, if, if, if women, too many. <laughs> if, if women's sports were actually going to end in some way, um, I mean, it's just not happening. Wouldn't you think there would be more trans women in sports when the majority of states do allow trans women full participation? International titles, zero. I want to move on background. to a different topic. I want to talk about Me Too and sort of this social movement that we've lived through, we're living through right now. What is the state of feminism sort of in this post Me Too era? We're in post Me Too? All right. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't Tell me. Like it. Um, sorry, I got distracted by the Me Too part. Uh, so I was like, we're post Me Too? Wow, like, no one's getting, like, sexually harassed anymore. Like, <laughs> we did it, guys. Out. We so... Oh, I just can't with the attitudes and the condescension, but it's fine. The right? problem. <laughs> that world. Um, no, I, I, I think 
obviously the, the state of feminism is very much reflected right in this room, but Me Too for me, right, in a particular context means something for different people. It's a different experience for different people. In, in my culture and in my community, we're still working through that. There is no post Me Too, right? We're still working through how do we have these tough conversations? How do we teach not just, you know, women, but everyone about consent? What does consent look like? What does that look like in our community? What does that not look like? Right, all those things that I think it's still very complicated. But I think it starts at the level of community, right, of like how do we have these conversations around consent? Sydney, I saw your hand up. So uh, when the Me Too thing was unfolding, I was initially like, great, I love the idea of women being able to speak out. What's been really disappointing, I suppose, for me, post Me Too, as, as we're calling it, is that, and especially as someone who's sort of on the right wing of politics, um, I think that a lot of the experiences of women on the right get a bit trivialized because there is a lot of politicizing of sexual assault. So when something legitimately happens on our side of the table and someone tries to speak up about it, there's almost an automatic disbelief and I understand why it's because of the believe all women type of stuff that, that came out of the Me Too movement that a lot of us were like wait a minute no no people do use these situations for gain people do make things up people do lie but it is sad to watch it happen it makes me sad that we're here Jordan I feel like there'll never be a post Me Too because at the heart of it, Me Too is just a phrase. The spirit of what Me Too represented will always be relevant, and that is that you are empowering individual women to advocate for themselves and speak out when they feel like they're being wrong. Ideally, you're just trying to be the most transparent and self-accountable person you can be, and you need to hit all of those fronts, If again, if you want it to last on the cultural level. How, yeah, I mean, I don't see any major super major issues with Me Too, although I think it did muddy the waters as far as sexual assault is concerned, and I'm certainly against this hashtag believe all women thing that's going around, and I don't know why necessarily Me Too has to be completely women-focused. Uh, if you want to talk about something that's happened to you or some abuse that you've gone through, it should, shouldn't matter what sex you are. So men and women should feel empowered to talk about uh, times where they've been victimized in that in that way uh and yeah the believe all women stuff complete bs and we're, we're seeing that sort of pan out and it's all about finding that fine balance of yeah we want people who've been affected by horrible things to be able to speak about this and to be able to hold others accountable but we also don't want bad people to be able to take on these these movements and uh push them for something that isn't good about beauty standards we we talked a little bit about this this got brought up at the beginning. How does that tie into femininity? Sorry, I'm very into this idea because I do think it is one of the larger intersections that just doesn't get very discussed, which is like I was talking about before, barriers and friction are placed up around bodies. And the fatter I get, the older I get, the less people will listen to me, the less value I will have for society. So, you know, I'm already starting out as a woman with no legs. If I had something on my face, I have my beauty. That's one of my privileges. I have my whiteness. That's one of my privileges. I used to have thinness and now I'm getting fatter. Things are changing. And I think every single time that we talk about feminism, um, pretty privilege should be discussed because we have these ideas. If you, your skin tone is this, if your hair is this, if your body looks like that, it's about whether or not you are given um, an equal opportunity based on what you look like. There's certainly true to that. Pretty privilege exists. It exists for men and it exists for women. It is across the board. If you are a seemingly attractive person, you are going to go about life uh, a lot more smoothly than other people are. Now, we can acknowledge that that is the case and also say that, hey, you know, if you didn't get that, that those cards th thrown out to you, is it necessarily like a, a barrier that needs to be fought? Sure. I mean, it's something like a, a stigma that we can talk about. It's something we can discuss that people know that they have a propensity to do that. Okay, fine. But it doesn't mean that you lack value if you are not an attractive person. It, it means that, you know, you might have a little bit of a harder time going through things, but you, you decide what your value is. 
we watched a video, we did a video about this girl who complained about aging, how a woman's value is in her age and in her youth and in her beauty. And to that, I say, no, it's not. Yeah, that's that's your description of what makes a woman valuable. It's your description of what makes yourself valuable. I don't view beauty or or thinness or age as something that makes me inherently valuable. Will I be sad to see those things go as time as time moves forward? Maybe, maybe, maybe for a moment I will grieve my my younger, uh, more youthful self. But that's not where I see my value lying as a person. And as so long as you do that your life is going to be miserable. Again, it's mindset. Right. And we talked about this when we reacted to that first video that you just referenced. But uh, the question is, who told you that your value is derived from what society says about you? And I think that that's, you know, what's what's an empowering message is to say, you know, if someone's going to treat you as less because you're aging or because you're you're less physically attractive by, you know, whatever objective or, or historical, you might say, standards, uh, that's on them. And that's not a reflection of of your value. And you don't have to accept that for yourself. And like you said, mm-hmm. a lot of these, you know, these perceptions are out there. And that's just a, a basic fact of life, just as much as look, I'm getting older, I'm getting slower, I can't, I'm not as fast on the volleyball court mm-hmm. as I used to be. I'm not as strong as and quick as I used to be. I'm, you know, I'm getting over the hill of in my early 30s. And, you know, but that's yeah. just, that's just life, man. All of us have to deal with that on some level. And I get that it, that it's it's unique and there's like pre- specific pressures around beauty for women and all that. And I don't want to diminish that anyway. But at the end of the day, you got to sure. just at the core of the question is you got to have a sense of self-worth that isn't attached to people's opinions or society's, you know, perceptions of you. Um, you got to be because how else are you going to rise above that? And that's what's empowering is not this, this you're a victim of society, you're a victim of these standards. But the empowering thing is to say, no, you you have value in spite of what society might say or what anyone else might say. 100%. Just like, it really is where where you put your mind and like your map is just so important to how you go about life. You really have to step outside yourself for a second and go, yeah, whatever is thrown at me, I'm going to overcome. Um, I think a lot of times the women that complain about beauty standards don't complain about them when they got privilege when they were young and attractive and thin. So it's like, yeah, you're complaining when the privilege is gone, but privilege is but privilege is invisible to those who have it. And women, it's it's a privilege. And men don't turn 18 and get looks that we get. As a black woman, uh, one of the most integral parts of the beauty conversation has become has been colorism. Um, I'm a dark-skinned Black woman, proud of it and proud of being myself. Um, for the most part, I did not... Oh, why am I going to cry about this? Mm-hmm. I did not grow up thinking I was beautiful because I was that. And I think in the Black, in the black space... Um, we have these conversations, but I think I'm kind of glad, I'm glad I bring it up because I think feminists actually really should be part of the colorism topic because colorism is not just shades within being black. It shades because they're, again, the beauty standard is the closer to whiteness you are, the more beautiful you are. I think it's something that if more people in different shades, particularly white women, because of knowing that standard and we work together on that, then we have a lot I think something we can unify on, but also something that we can make strides in right now that I'm just not seeing. And it's only, again, it's, that's why people feel like you have to be a black feminist because it's, an, it's a topic that only really black feminists are talking about because it deals with being... Your, your oh, sperm don't make you male. Then what does? It's a constellation. Being black. Hmm. I mean, that's just sad to me. Why did nobody ever tell her that you can be beautiful uh, regardless of what your your skin color is? And that would have been, I think, a very simple fix. Somebody as a child saying, you know what? Your dark skin tone does not change how beautiful you are. And really, it doesn't matter where how other people perceive you as far as your beauty. It matters how you perceive yourself. And to have not been told that, I think, is a, is a sad thing. But also... We all go through our own personal insecurities in our lives that we deal with, that we view ourselves as, and sometimes they are delusional. In high school, I thought that I was getting like fat and gaining weight and all these different things. I look exactly like I looked, like I look right now. So sometimes we engage in delusional thinking and insecure thinking because we think there must be something 
wrong with myself. There must be something that needs to be changed. And more often than not, you're wrong about that. And that's okay. And it's sad and it's something that you go through, but it doesn't have to color your worldview. Color, no pun intended, for the rest of your life. How how do beauty standards make you feel, Morris? I mean, kind of what you're saying, um, Antonia, as a black Latina woman in my community, right? Like I grew up and I was ugly, right? Like that's what I was considered. I was not considered beautiful of feeling ugly, but also being told I was, right? Had a lot to do with what is believed in my community, right? Colorism is one of them. And so to say, I'm gonna redefine beauty for myself and to say, I own myself and I get to decide what's beautiful, right? And I get to decide what I wanna wear and how I wanna wear it. And I don't need to, right? It's, it's, it's almost a repelling, right? Like, I'm like, no, you know what? I am beautiful. I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm going to feel myself because if no one else is going to feel me, it's on me to feel me too. I got to say, though, I did grow up being referred to as very beautiful for a woman with a disability, and that, to me, always fed this idea that disability doesn't mean beautiful. I am in some form of exceptionalism, which I then had to keep up with forever. So it's like I got this thought as I started to age, like, you can have no legs, but you better not fucking get fat. And so this idea that like there are certain people who are beautiful and certain people who aren't, and that inherently holds value is, I think, you know, find it in yourself, yes. And Jordan? I mean, we can ignore reality for as much as we want and say that it makes us feel bad, but we just, it's, it's still there. Nonetheless, I mean... I, I get it. You know, I think that I think for the most part, most people are 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 very very beautiful. I don't go around walking down the street thinking, "Oh my gosh, that person is so ugly. That person is so ugly. That person is so ugly." However, there are certain standards that we all hold with hold within ourselves. There are certain prejudices that we all have, uh, and we view those when we are out in the natural world. To deny that those things exist for the sake of not having people feel bad about themselves is just not going to serve anybody. Beauty standards are toxic bullshit hierarchical nonsense, (laughs) and I say that as someone who has spent over a year collectively Mm -hmm. of my life in eating disorder institutions because I have tried to put my body through hellish things to meet these beauty standards, which more often than not are not based in reality. They're That's a good point to make too, that there are beauty standards that are not based in reality. When I say beauty standard, I just mean being in a healthy body, treating your body well, eating well, and letting that show in whatever way that shows for you. And it's going to be different for different people as they walk uh, about their lives. But to say because something negatively impacted me, it is BS, is just false. It's, it's not the case. Beauty standards can negatively impact you, right? And you can go through uh, this time of trying to force your body, you know, into a place that you're not capable of getting to at a certain point. But that doesn't mean that the standard itself is something that's unacceptable or something that's crazy to have. Uh, and that's where we're getting sort of off our rockers as a society in, as a whole. Because we're saying because something made me feel bad that thing should not exist because I am a feminine man and I feel like a woman biological reality should not exist. It it just doesn't work that way because beauty standards make me feel bad about myself. They should not exist because somebody saying that obesity is bad makes me feel bad about myself. Obesity is bad should not exist that you see these just, loops we're getting into now because we don't like the way something sounds or the way it makes us feel that doesn't mean that it's not true typically trends they're created to push things they're extremely useful for marketing but they don't serve anyone's health they don't serve anyone's self-esteem they only act to try and tell us that there's a allegedly right way to have a body and if you don't occupy that space and have that body then you're a piece of shit which is absolute nonsense. And there are way too many women and men in the world who end up doing terrible things to themselves because they fall into this trap of thinking that you have to be this way. And if you aren't this way, then there's something inherently wrong at your core, which is nonsense. You're perfect the way you are. 
Or that's, that's literally the core of it. You are perfect the way you are. And anyone who tries to tell you otherwise is feeding into this industry and is just, they are not your friend or looking out for you. But you're not, not always perfect the way you are, okay? If you go to the doctor and they're saying, ma'am, you're 300 pounds. I'm worried about you having a heart attack. I feel like your arteries are going to get clogged. We need to do something about this. And doing something about it does require you to lose weight and fit yourself to this standard of a body. Are you going to say, no, I'm perfect the way that I am? Is, is hearing that you are perfect the way you are worth the amount of time that you are shaving off of your life because you refuse to accept reality? Because you refuse to take a dose of what everybody needs and that is just a simple reality check? No, it's not worth it. So these words sound great. They make you feel good, but it's not the truth. Yeah. Layla? Oh, yeah. I was going to say, yeah, beauty in the industry is exploitative. Um, but also we have to remember a lot of the beauty standards are based around health, what's perceived as health, like symmetry, um, certain weights, things like that. So there is that side where we have to balance it. And I think we're seeing so much more representation, which I think is incredibly important. Well, I just think that like, if women really cared about beauty standards, like the obesity rate wouldn't be what it is. But what it's about trying you? to attain the beauty standards. I don't, I mean, I just think like some people are more attractive, I mean, some people are less attractive. She's not obese. They should say, what about you? Active, and that's just, you know, where, where would I rate myself one to ten? Well, we're not you rating, know? it's okay. That's what, that's what I mean. Like, I just think like some people so are more attractive. So if you are overweight, you don't care about beauty standards. Well, is that the, right? Like the point is that the beauty standard is thin, right? Your yeah, standard? Obesity comes from men. Gosh. Simple question. The amount of just dodging to simple question. The beauty standard is thin, isn't it? And she's so scared of being caught in an argument where she's not trying to be thin, right? Or the other woman who's sitting next to Pearl is not trying to be thin. She's so scared of the reality of that argument that she can't even accept the very premise of her own own complaint <laughs> that thinness is the beauty standard wow and women though yeah you're right that's true but i'm saying if women really wanted to fit the beauty standard they would be thin i know i just from my experience as well as growing up again in a mostly white neighborhood where but i was always comparing myself to literally other people who have a different body type but i wasn't cons i was considered other or to something because it didn't conform to that body type when that same body type became popular to with Kim Kardashian and the Kardashians who are different, right, <laughs> than me. Let's just say our different skin color, right? Um, and Nicki Minaj, Cardi B, Meg Thee Stallion. Those are all black women who are famous at the same time as Kim Kardashian, have even bigger bodies than Kim Kardashian, and are highly sexualized for the bodies that they possess. So we cherry pick and we pick women who fit the narrative that we're talking about. Kim Kardashian, who's not even white, she's Armenian, and she's saying, oh, well, Kim Kardashian can have a bigger body, but when I have it because I'm black, it's not accepted. Never mind all of the very famous bigger black celebrities who flaunt their body, write songs about how big their bodies are, how slim, thick they are, and all this stuff about how men want to be with them. Never mind those. We turn a blind eye to those women. My body is not accepted because I've accepted the narrative that blackness makes me unattractive. And there's a lot of animosity I, I, in a lot of you know black communities of the fact that um, when it was on black skin, it was an issue. But when it was on Kim Kardashian and the Kardashians, it was a billion dollar business. Yep. Our time together has almost come to an end. We sort of started talking about feminism, big picture. We're going to try again. Is feminism dead? I think feminism is alive. And I'm thankful to be a participant and believer of it. I, girl, because you don't seem like, well, you seem fuck miserable. <laughs> You've been screaming, crying this whole time, sitting there so upset to hear an opinion from a woman, so upset to hear women express on a, a syndicated news outlet their own opinions, that you are literally jumping out of your skin. Oh, but you're so excited to be a participant. I'm so encouraged. I would say as far as the West goes, I think that feminism has been cannibalized by other movements like leftism, like transgenderism, 
So I, I think feminism is very much alive and well. I think it takes different forms depending on who you're talking to, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. And as I've defined in the beginning, for me, I use it as a lens. So I, I don't think I'll ever stop having it in my, my arsenal, if you will. I respect Jordan. Good advice panel. <laughs> respect. Okay, it. we're done. Oh, we're done. Oh my gosh. I mean, I have to remind Man. you guys, this was, a, this was a four to five hour conversation. I don't know that I'd be able to stomach it. I'd have to send Taylor in my stead. I I don't know. If I put heels on, they let me participate. So there you go. <laughs> you get the main floor. I feel like Eli spoke more than any other person at hmm. this feminist panel. I'm trying to put together final thoughts. Uh, final thoughts. I watched 42 minutes of women just dodging what are very basic questions about really being able to lay out the barriers that women face in the United States of America. We got two examples, and that was abortion, a highly contested and debated among feminists issue, and we got the pay gap. One that if you take just a moment to look into other factors that need to be taken into account is easily debunkable and nearly uh, non-existent. So I was waiting, just waiting, waiting for another barrier, waiting to hear it, and we did not get it. Instead, we heard a uh, very weak defense of intersectionality that was just used to, again, dodge questions, a defense of biological men having spaces in, not even having spaces, but being put into female spaces at the expense of biological women, uh, strong support for abortion, and sometimes even cheering it on, saying that it's a good thing, and then a defense of the hashtag MeToo movement is really neither here nor there brought about some good and some bad and it's really not women focused or should not have been women focused so i i watched it <laughs> those are my thoughts guys i hope you enjoyed it if there's a point that i missed or you know a, a better way to debate those leftist points that were being made in the video drop it down below in the comments i'm sure there's many leftist people watching right now who thought i would have been better on that panel and you probably would have been so drop your thoughts in the comments down below please like subscribe click the notification bell to be notified every single time we post a new video for you guys and have a fantastic weekend i'm gonna see you